Amen. You know, as we come together this, this evening, this not evening, this afternoon, you know, it's always a great time when we come into this building where we worship Jesus, where we could unite together, when we bring all our problems, all our burdens. You know, this is the place where we can be heard. This is a place where we can receive the peace in our hearts. If we come with pain, and I believe that Jesus is, if we come to him, when we come to him, not in our mind, maybe when we step out physically and say, Lord, I need your peace. I need your comfort today. I deeply believe that we can walk away as a different person. You know, this month as a church, we're covering the topic of the sermon series is of significance or significant significance. If you were here two weeks ago, they talked, the topic which was spoken about was the significance that you are significant, that Jesus came down to this earth because of you. Last week, there was a great sermon. You can watch it on our YouTube is what you do is significant. You are significant. And at the same time, the other people around you are also significant. So when we look at this word significant, hopefully this PowerPoint is going to work. It will be easier if we, let me see if we can get it to work. Thank you so much. So what does it mean when we look at that word significance from the very uh, biblical, not even biblical, just a regular secular dictionary is the, the quality of being worthy of attention or importance. You know, there's a lot of things in life that we do, which is significant. There are many things of significance in our life. For example, me personally, I like to read books. I try to, I put a goal in the beginning of the year to read at least one book a month. And the books that I read, I believe they're books of significance that could change the way I think, the way I lead, the way I talk to people. And I kind of choose the books that are important to me in, in, one, in this the season that I'm in. But there's also a book that a lot of homes have, that a lot of people have in their homes, and it's the Word of God, it's the Bible. I want to talk about the significance of Scripture or the significance of having the Word of God in front of us. When we look, you look at it, you look online, it says it's the best-selling book of all time. Over 5 billion copies sold to date. A lot of people... In the beginning of the year, me included, we put a goal. I want to read the entire Bible in the next 365 days. A lot of people put this goal. Some people reach it. Some people don't reach it. Some people kind of stop midway. Hopefully people last longer than January, February. But a lot of times we stop reading it. So the question is, is the Bible that we have in our hands, that we have on our iPads, the scripture itself, is, is it significant or is it not significant? You know, you look at St. Jerome. Uh, if we look at St. Jerome, this is what he says. Ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. So think about those words. The, your ignorance of scripture that we have in our hands, that we have in our homes, that our kids have, is ignorance of Jesus Christ himself. We're going to see that everything, it comes together. You can't say that I'm a believer or that I follow Jesus, and yet his word we neglect or we put to the side. We know that the Bible is the most important book ever written. Historically, it is proven. The events that change the entire magnitude of the world and of the time that we're living in now, a lot of people claimed that I am the Messiah, that I am Jesus, that I am God. A lot of these people who, says, who said I am the one, they're all in the grave, including going back to Buddha, Gandhi, Muhammad. Everyone died at one point, but there was a man, and we know that was Jesus Christ, who said, I am here. I'm going to die, but I'm going to resurrect on the third day. He's the only one that ever made the claim. He's the only one that risen from the dead and yet is alive today in heaven. I want to talk about the significance of Scripture. I want to break down this message for the time that we have together into three parts. First part is going to be, hopefully I don't bore anyone with the very first part, but it's going to be the uh, seminary side of it. 
Second part is the biblical side, and the third is the practical side. So I want to look at scripture from three different, from three different uh, perspectives. From the uh, seminary, I always try to say cemetery, but from the seminary side, from the biblical side, or from the practical side. So number one is going to be, can we trust it? Number two, the uh, part two is going to be, can, why do we read scripture? And number three is, I believe, some tips that can help us when we're reading scripture that helped me tremendously in my life. So point number, uh, number one. Uh, let's see, this PowerPoint is not working again. That's why I always like the guys who do the clicking in the back. Uh, part number one, can we trust it? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Second, uh, okay, 2 Timothy 3, 16. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness. All scripture is inspired by God. We hear that a lot. It's a lot of times that word, uh, the, the verse is kind of cut off at that moment, and we kind of say, all Scripture, everything is inspired by God. Everything, the Bible was written by 40 authors under the direction of the Holy Spirit, and that's the, the canon, everything that we have together right now. We know that the book is a book of covenant, and it's just not things that are said one-sided, but it also describes who God is. If we are faithful to him, the Bible says he's also going to be faithful to us. We need the Bible to have a dialogue with us. It's not something that I read and I just put a, and I put a, just a check mark that I'm done reading for today. I'm done for the week. I'm done for the month. I'm done my reading plan. But we need the Bible that we have for it to speak to us, as it says in this verse, that it can either rebuke and can correct. It can guide us. That is what scripture is. But there's another passage in Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Now, the Bible is honest, and it doesn't lie. And it's one thing, if I were to tell you, I, I promise you, this is going to happen to you. I want to say that this is going to happen in your life. You can trust me. You might not trust me. It depends how you know me. Does my word have any authority in your life? But we have the scripture where Jesus, if the Bible speaks of something, that it has to come to pass. Why? Because Psalm 138.2, it says the following. David says, I worship towards your holy temple and I praise your name for your love, love and kindness and your truth. This is the part. For you have magnified your word above your name. You have magnified your word the scripture above your name. He submits himself to the words that are written in there. Think about it. He said, I put those scripture, the word of God, above my own name. There is value. There is significance in the Bible that we hold in our hands. And we have to come to love this book. But a lot, a lot of times, you know, those words, all scripture is inspired. It sounds good. It sounds beautiful. When, you, when you're in, in the church. But a lot of times, can we really trust it? Why do I say that? Because we hear a lot of, we say, people say at work, I heard it a couple weeks ago, a month ago, when we were talking among the coworkers, and I said, because there's a lot of contradictions in this book. There's a lot of things that were written a long time ago. The question is, can I trust it today in the time that I live now? There's a lack of assurance the Bible that was written 2,000 years ago, a lot of things have changed over the years. We live in a different time now. Can I really trust the Bible that I have now? A lot of people started at work, started talking about the different translations. How can you trust it? This has so many translations. You look at the Quran. It only has one, it's only in one language. And you look at the Christian side, the Bible, so many translations, so many, and it changes so quickly. So there's new updates to it. Can I really trust it? We don't have, people say we don't have the originals of it. We only have the manuscripts of it. And manuscripts is the copied version. And then they say, and then each manuscript is different. Nothing is identical. Nothing matches. Can I really trust something that I have in my hand? Maybe something that my parents just made, forced me to do it. And then you come across this man who's a Bible scholar, who was a Christian at one time. He stepped away and became an atheist, and he started going against Christianity. And then he comes up, 
And in his book, he writes this. And if you ever read one of his books, very popular, you can find people talk about him all the time, Bar Ehrman. The book is called Misquoting Jesus. But look at the words. What good is it to say that the autographs, the originals, were inspired? We don't have the originals. We only have error-written copies. And the vast majority of these are, century, are centuries removed from the originals and different from them, evidently in thousands of ways. There, this is the key word, which is a lot of times pulled out of context. I want you to focus. There are more variations among our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. So imagine if your child or you yourself are in college and you just hear the last statement because it's pulled out of context. There are more variations among our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. You know, the first thing that comes to our mind is, like, what am I reading then? Can I really trust what I have? And if it's your first time looking at this type of language and you look at what is a variation, a textual variant is any place among the manuscripts in which there's a variation in wording, including word, order, admission, or addition of words, or even spelling or differences. So we, one way is it's a mistake. They say there's a lot of mistakes, more mistakes in the Bible, in the New Testament, than there's actually words in the New Testament. For me, that's a red flag. I'm thinking, okay, can I really trust this? And at one point, I started to look at it. You want to find more information about this? There's a podcast by Janata Vitorsky, Clark Abbott, and David Krukovitz. They do not, uh, not, remind me, the now and not yet. I listened to this months ago, then I refreshed my mind when I was preparing this because I ran, I, I ran into this myself when people started talking. We have to look at this. It's not the number of variants that are important. It's the nature of it. It's not the quantity, but it's the quality of the differences. Those words play a drastic difference the way you attack this situation. Why am I saying this? Because when you look at this phrase, more variations in their manuscripts than their words in the New Testament, the questions that I have is, what does this actually mean? So when you break it down, you look at the Greek. So in the Greek, so what does that actually mean? In the Greek, and from the Greek, there's 138,000 words in the New Testament. But there's over 500,000 variants that they call in the New Testament. So if someone told you this is school, you know your Bible has 138,000 words, but there's 500,000 mistakes. That is mind-blowing in my mind. I'm thinking, what kind of Bible do we really have at the end of the day? If this is really true, what these scholars are telling our kids, what if you take any of the classes in, in college, they always refer to Bart Ehrman, this man. It sounds like a problem, but in a way, it's not a problem. Why? Because when you look at how many manuscripts and what kind of variants are we talking about, you look, there's roughly 5,500 Greek manuscripts. If you look at it, the other languages, Latin and everything else, it totals to 25,000 manuscripts. So the New Testament, the, the Bible itself, you got to realize this, has the most manuscripts from any ancient literature that is out there. So the more manuscripts you have, think about it, the more manuscripts you have, the more times someone wrote the New Testament, the book of John, the, the gospel of Mark, the more of these you have, the more mistakes you're likely to have. But it doesn't negate the fact or say that, hey, your Bible is wrong because it has all of these mistakes. So the more text you have, the more variations that you will have. But the New Testament is much closer to the originals than any copies of the Iliad from the Greek mythology that we have. So what is my point in all of this? If I want to show you this uh, slide that right here. You look at this thing. You look at the right column, the manuscripts. How many manuscripts you have from Plato, from the Iliad? Everything that we, ref that we, that we learn when we're in college or in high school. We read that literature, or at least I read some of that, the, Iliad, the Gilead Wars. A lot of stuff, we read that stuff in school. If you look at the right column, you can see how many manuscripts they have that no one ever questions and says, you know what, maybe it's, not re maybe it's fake, maybe it's not real, maybe it's not accurate. But no one ever questions. They only have 200 copies. They only have 500 copies. And then you look at the New Testament. You have over 5,000 manuscripts. People actually physically were writing things at that time. They weren't copying everything else that was around. If you look at the Greek, 5,000. Then it says plus 18,000. But the most beautiful thing, and when you look at the gap from the original, how many years after it happened was this actually written? And the Bible is the only 
ancient piece or document, manuscript, that is the first, it's after the first one, as I believe, was written after 30 years only. After the event had happened, 30 years passed, and it was already documented. You look at every other uh, ancient source, whatever it says, that the authors of who wrote it, it could be thousands of years, and yet, when we're in school, we're taught to believe and not to question any of that stuff. But yet we hear the words, you know, the Bible has so many mistakes. The Bible has so many variants. But it's so misleading when you just look at it from the grand scheme of things. Why? Because there are biblical scholars who study textual criticism. That's what it's called. They're atheists. It doesn't matter who they are. They can be Christian, atheists. It doesn't matter from which, what, which walk of life they come from. It doesn't matter which country they're in. But they follow the same exact signs. And at the end... They all agree which one is true, <coughs> which one is not. So when they look at not all variants are the same. I'm quickly not going to go into depth that this is not the most important part of the message. There's four different types of variants when you look at it. So when someone says there's 500,000 mistakes, the question is what kind of mistakes are we talking about? So number one is it kind of characterizes in this. They're not, it's, not, it's not viable, it's not meaningful, it's viable, but it's not meaningful, it's meaningful, but it's not viable, it's viable, and it's meaningful. We'll see what I'm talking about. So when you look at this, it's not viable, and it doesn't mean anything. And 85% of the variants fall in this category right away. What does that mean? It says it's the slip of a pen, a missed comma, or wrong spelling. Theologically, it's insignificant. But when you compare a manuscript to a manuscript, someone has a missing comma, okay, this is a different type of manuscript. And this is a considered a variant. It means it's a mistake. It doesn't match. It's not identical. But when the scholars, they're atheist Christians, when they all look at it all together in different countries, from wherever the manuscripts are fall, they fall, wherever they find them, they come down through the same process of elimination, and they all come to the same conclusion that 85% of them, they're not viable and they're not meaningful. Then you have a different one. It's viable, but it's not meaningful. Meaning, one manuscript is going to have the name John. It's going to have two ends. One is going to have one end. And that's already different. Is it viable? Sure, it's not accurate. But it's not meaningful. It doesn't change anything overall. The third group is meaningful, but it's not viable. It's one manuscript. When you look, say, for example, uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 22 and then you look at, in a different manuscripts, the ending, it doesn't, so for example, Luke 6.22 says, Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile and spurn on your name as evil, on the account on the Son of Man. Because of Jesus, they do this. Another translation, it doesn't have on the account on the Son of Man. So you can think about, okay, are they going to hate you just because they hate you, or is it because of Jesus? So it's meaningful, but at the same time, it's not viable. Then you look at the main one where it's both viable and meaningful. At the end of the day, it's less than 1%. When you look at the words in this verse, and, let our, and we are writing these things to you so that our joy may be complete. The next one says, we're writing to you these things so that your joy can be complete. So just the two words, yours and ours, but it can change the entire meaning. But then at the end of the day, it only happened in one manuscript that it didn't match up with the originals, but it was still this variant or mistake. But at the end of the day, this is the most beautiful thing that a lot of people don't really say, is this man, Bart Ehrman, was once asked, do these variants put the core tenets of the Christian uh, orthodoxy in jeopardy? Do we have to pay attention to any of these mistakes? The same guy who says there's more mistakes in the New Testament than there's words says the following, essential Christian beliefs are not affected by the textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. You don't see this thing mentioned in colleges. You only, fee, you only see the first part of it, that, hey, there's more variants in the New Testament than there's words in the New Testament. This is an interesting quote by this man. To be skeptical of the results of the New Testament books is to allow all of the classical things material to slip into obscurity something that's not important for no documents of the ancient period are well off attested bibliographically as the new testament think about it the new testament is tested and far up superior above any other literature that we're going to read in college or in high school 
when they compare it, so what does this actually mean? Uh, PowerPoint stopped working, I apologize. So what does this actually mean when you break it down? Uh, there's an example that I wanted to show. It's an illustration and it describes the variance itself and how we, look at this. So you have the phrase, you have won $10 million. You see it in the King James Version, thou has won $10 million. Then the second one, look at that. You have, y'all have won 10,000, but it's, an, it's a numeric thing, $10,000. When you look at the difference between those things, the second line has 28 letters, but only five letters are the same from the third line. The H, the W, and the O, and the N. Five letters, which are the same. That's only 19% is identical, that it matches. But yet, it conveys the message at 100%. It's the exact same message, just worded different. Some, so they come to the conclusion, it's the same way in the New Testament. When you look at these scholars, look at them. They say that the New Testament man. Uh, manuscripts are 99.75% accurate, 98.33, 99.9% accurate when they compare them to each other. And there is no historical document ever that was produced that is as accurate as the Bible that we hold in our hands. So when someone says to you, you know, the Bible that you have is not accurate, I want to say that it is incomplete and it's not true. This man says the same thing, Bart Ehrman. Most of the changes found in our early Christian manuscripts have nothing to do with theology or ideology. So I want us to be confident, the Bibles that we have in our hand, that they are significant enough for us to read and for us to not say, you know, this document is from 2,000 years ago. It has no value. We're living in today's world, in the modern world where everything changed. But the Bible that we have is significant. So if, it, if it's significant, if, if there is value to it, then the question stands is, part two, what are the reasons to read the Bible. So number one, what we talk about, the Bible itself will reveal Jesus. John 5, 39 says, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. The purpose, you know, is not to fall in love with the Bible itself, but to fall in love with Jesus, who we see in the Bible. Ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. We're not to fall in love with the Bible itself, but what's in it is not as a doctrine. It's not as a historical document, but it's of Jesus, to fall in love with Jesus. Because studying the scripture, it points to Jesus. The whole point is to have this relationship. It's just not to have this information inside of us. You know, the Bible, it's, it's not my God with a lowercase g. Scripture is not Jesus. You start with scripture, you're grounded in scripture, but it points you to the one who gave his life for you and for me. For us to have this relationship, say, Jesus, I, I want to know you more. And that's how he reveals himself. How he put, so that's why it says the scripture points to Jesus. When we read the scripture, we get to know who Jesus was, who the Father is, who the Holy Spirit is, and it comes together when we have this relationship. Jesus says also that I am the way the truth, and the light. And no one can come to God only through me. I am the doorway to get to heaven. I am the ticket to get to heaven. It is Jesus Christ himself. Uh, that's why a lot of people say Jesus was only a prophet. Sure, he was a prophet, but if you only stop at that, that he was a prophet, there's no way for you to get to heaven. And people think they're going to heaven bypassing Jesus without believing in Jesus himself. Think about it. We come to living today, talking to people at work, they, they, they can say that Jesus was only a man. He was only a prophet. And then when you ask, are you going to heaven? Yes, I'm going to heaven. So my question is, what kind of theology? How do you believe you're going to get to him if the scripture says the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ himself? And when we go to the cross, and that's through the cross, through Calvary, what happened 2,000 years ago? Everything is interconnected at the end. Number two. The Bible will help you defeat or conquer sin. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So it gives you victory over temptations. It helps you uproot any sin out of your life. 
the more word of God we have inside of us, the less flesh, the less sin we're going to have. Whatever we fill ourselves in at the same time is also what's going to come out of our mouth. So more word, less flesh, what we fill in, that's what we give out. It's simple. And yet a lot of times we try to complicate it. If you want to defeat sin, if you want to conquer, conquer is probably not the good word for it, but if you want to defeat, overcome the temptations in life, you have the word of God that's able to help you defeat, defeat it. Number three, kind of goes to what, number two. The Bible is a sword to the believer. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This from Ephesians is talking about the armor of God. There's one testimony that I, I heard when a, a church or a minister, they're doing a, minister, a ministry of deliverance. And he said, we we're praying, we we're praying for, for one person to get delivered that came to our church. And then he said, the, uh, the demon inside a person started speaking. And he said, there's two people praying. And he said, this person has on the spiritual armor. He said, you do not. So this man, he said, we're in a war. We're in a spiritual war. There's a physical war. Sure, we can say there's a war going on in Ukraine. But at the same time, there's a spiritual world that, war that is going around. That's why Paul, a lot of times he addresses, and he always uses this imagery for, uh, from war. Why? If there's a war going on, if there was no war going on, there's no need to put on our spiritual armor. And what is the spiritual armor? It is the helmet of salvation the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the sword of the spirit. And when we have this on us, and that's why after hearing that, I started, I changed my prayer. I said, Lord, when I go out in the morning, I said, Lord, I put on my spiritual armor. I'm going to walk out of my house. There's a spiritual war that is going around me everywhere I go. I want to be protected by the blood of Jesus, and I'm going to be ready. I want to have the shield of faith. I want to have the sword of the spirit. I want to have the breastplate of righteousness. It's not me, but it's Jesus who is through, that is through me. At the same time, the Holy Spirit through me. At the same time, the belt of truth. It holds everything together, the truth that we know about him. So we don't study the Bible we won't know how, what to do when temptations, when problems come our way. We have to keep in mind that Satan is a spiritual being. And the only way to fight in a spiritual war is with a spiritual weapon. And the weapon that we have, that, that we have, it is the word of God. It's also interesting when you, if you look at another, this is just a side note, but spiritual, speaking of spiritual weapons, when these, a lot of these people, whoever follows Bob Larson and any of these guys who do mass deliverances, they say a lot of times they don't put their hand on the person when they pray. They'll, they'll put the word of God on the person. And a lot of times, he said, the, the demonic, the demons inside will start yelling. He said, take the sword out of me. Take your weapon. Take your sword out of me. It is a spiritual weapon. And, these, and the spiritual world understands the principles of how things operate, that the weapon that we have, it's a physical Bible, but it's also a weapon that we have in the spiritual world. But the most important thing, when you look at the, uh, when we look back at that verse, is that up here, when it says, which is the word of God? The word, when you look at the word, when you look at the Greek, the Greek refers to not just the word in general, but it's referred to as the rema word. And the rema word is when you're reading scripture, and something, pop, I don't want to say pops out, but something grabs your attention. And you receive some kind of revelation. You think, this word was for me at this moment in this time in my life. And that is what it's talking about. When you look at the Greek, the word is not the Logos version. It's the rema of it in the spiritual, in, it's in the spiritual uh, world, the demonic also understand. And when we receive this word, we can use the word. This promise that we receive from God and from that position, where it's a lot easier instead of going blindly trying to swing. But now you receive the word. When you're reading the, your word, you receive the word from heaven, the rema. And now with that position, you're able to step out and say, I received something from him. Now on this word, on this promise, I'm going to step out. I'm going to fight. I'm going to have my peace because I know I received my word, the word that I need, and I can go 
and fight and withstand mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, financial attacks. Anything that comes my way, but because I already received something for myself. And number four, the Bible increases your faith. So the faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word uh, and through the word of Christ. We know that food, the food for faith is the word of God. Think about it. The faith comes from hearing. Hearing what? We hear a lot of things in the world. We hear the gossip, the slander. We hear about the, the uh, uh, political things. We hear about economical things. We hear a lot of things. But the question is, do we hear what the Spirit, what the Bible is speaking to me? Because that's going to determine what kind of faith is going to build me up or something going to tear me down. Whatever I'm going to put in. The Bible says that, that the Word of God is able to increase our faith. That means on the opposite side, something is able to decrease your faith. If we start to listen to things that are not godly, we start to listen and fill our mind, our hearts, our emotions, our well-being, everything, and we start filling ourselves, things that are not of God, it's going to tear us down. And we're going to have no faith. When we're going to come to him, we're going to be like what, the, what, the, what James says. You're going to be double-minded. You won't have the faith because maybe this, maybe this. But if we fill our faith, if we fill ourselves with the faith of God, things change. So the word of God is our faith builder. The more you hear it, the more encouraged you, come, you can become. That's why testimonies, they defeated the devil by the power of the testimony and by the blood of the lamb. Testimonies have a huge, a huge way to increase our faith as well. Because it's based on something that God did for someone. He also can do it for the next person. If we base not on that person, not what happened to the person, but the faith, it, could, it increases our own faith when we hear that something similar. He was in a similar situation, but God was able to help him. God is also able to, excuse me, to help me. We know that God, he speaks through dreams, through visions, through prophets, but at the same time, he speaks through the word of God. I shared the testimony before. I'm not going to repeat myself, but I will just kind of briefly maybe mention these three examples from my, from my life when the Bible increases your faith. When we, when we are reading the word of God, when this word, when something, when the Bible speaks to us and we receive an answer, through the Bible itself. Going back to maybe 13 years ago, when we got married, we at one point we wanted to have kids, and my, was, my wife was unable to conceive. And long story short is I was like, God, it came to this moment in my life of desperation. I was like, God, I'm serving you. I'm doing this at that time. Oh, we're going here. We're doing this. We're doing this. God, we're doing this. And yet you can't answer my simple prayer. Like, what's wrong with you, God? At one point, because you know, that's like, I'm, I'm going I'm to I'm be done serving for a moment till God, you answer my question that I have before you. That was me being selfish, immature, and all of the things you can write off to that, sure. But there came a moment when I got on my knees and I was reading scripture, and this, this verse completely changed the direction and the focus of my life. I have it underlined, I have it even dated in my Bible. It says Psalm uh, 40. Verse 1, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. Read that multiple times before, and we probably read it multiple, you probably read it multiple times yourself. But for me, it was this, that I received, it was like a rema word. I was like, Lord, this is the answer. I don't know when it's going to happen. It can happen tomorrow, it can happen in a month, it can happen in a year. But I'm going to continue to do what I was doing before. And even if I don't receive, I'm going to serve you faithfully. I'm going to continue to be, serve the way I served. And the moment came, we're going to have kids uh, for th uh, three or four years. And the moment came when she got pregnant, we conceived. And we have Jeremiah who is sitting on the front row today. The time, life went on. We wanted to have another kid. And the same thing happened. I don't know why God led me this way. But every single child that was born, every single one I received through the scripture, that something is going to happen. Same thing. Same thing for Mark. There is a place in Ezekiel chapter 21 verse 14. Same thing. There was a scripture that opened up to me and I applied it in my life and it happened. 
Then the third child for Isaiah, the same exact thing. On February 30th, 2020, I was reading scripture, and this one place in Genesis chapter 17, it just completely opened up to me in a new way. And I was like, Lord, this is because we were praying all the time. It's not like random thing. I'm looking, I'm opening scripture, trying to find the best place that fits me. No, 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 no. You're, you're praying, you're seeking God, but at the same time, God is able to speak through his word that we have in front of us. And I knew at that moment that something changed. I didn't know when it's going to happen. This was, I even have it, this one also dated in my Bible. It was on uh, April 30th, 2020. And in August, we found out that we we're pregnant. What I want to say is this, the same thing can happen in your life. There is power in the word of God. If we know that there, it's significant historically, we're done debating that. But now the question comes to, am I reading this word of God? Am I believing the words that I read? Am I believing that this is a covenant that I have with Jesus? It's not only about him, it's not all about me, but it's a relationship. When I seek Jesus, where it directs me to him, and the same points that we kind of just talked about, that I'm able, when I have this, the sword of the spirit, I'm able to overcome the temptations, the sinful lust, anything in my life, because I know that I know in the one that I believed. And the scripture that I have in front of me, it's of great significance. So number, uh, the last part is more of the practical side. It's, I read this in a book. It was a book that I read years, years ago. I had to read your Bible. At one point, I was like, what is the correct way? There's, I mean, there's multiple ways of reading the Bible. But this author put it in such a practical way that I personally kind of, a lot of things, I, I changed the way I read. So point, uh, point number one is watch, like, watch the whole movie. What does that mean? All of us watch movies, cartoons, whatever. We all have our favorites that we would like to watch. So imagine if I come to your house, you come to my house, I invited you for a movie night, we all sit. And we turn on the movie, and as soon as the first scene is over, I click pause and I just start talking, hey, let's talk about this. What just happened in the first scene? You think, okay, this is a little weird, like no one watches movie this way. And we talked about it for a moment, and then I click play, we start watching it. Scene two finishes, I pause again, because let's talk about scene two. Okay, then you, now you're getting like irritated, because I can't even enjoy the movie, you're stopping it too much. Scene three, scene four, and we stop at every single scene and we just talk about it. You know, instead of a two-hour movie, it becomes eight Fridays that we have to get together to, to watch this movie. N no one does this. But a lot of times, when we study the Word of God, we do the exact same thing. We start reading it, and we just read a short period. We just read a chapter, a paragraph. Okay, this is, I'm done. And we close the Bible, and then the next day we go back to it, and you forgot what you just read yesterday, and you have these pauses, and you're not going, you don't see the whole picture. You don't see the entire movie, but we just pick these sections that we want to study, that we want to talk about. And all of that has its place. But if we want to see what the Lord is trying to say, we have to read the entire book. And I'm going to see, I want to explain what I mean. To enjoy the Bible, you read more of it. So I want to say this. There's an example that I want to share with you. So it's the same thing. You're, well, interesting. But you're, okay, let's refocus. You receive, a, you, receive a, you receive something in the mail. You go to your mailbox and you receive a letter from your friend. And you open this letter. We don't read only the first paragraph. And the same thing we can look at as an example. You look at the book of Philippians. Only four chapters. Think about it. Only four chapters and you receive a letter. And the letter starts as following. Dear friend, I thank God every time I remember you. Every time I pray for you, I pray with joy. That's how Paul was writing to the Philippians. You receive the letter in the mail that is also four pages long. You're not going to stop at the first paragraph. And you're not going to say, and I'm going I'm to read the rest of it tomorrow. I want to read the rest of it the next day. You're going to go home and you're going to read this entire letter because it's from a friend. And the same thing here. So these letters that we have in the Bible that we see that there is, we know the 66 books in the Bible. There's about 30 books or so that are very short books that could be read in less than 30 minutes. So the point is this. When I read these books, like when I have my daily Bible plan, that's what I, I started to do. 
you break all of the easy books. I'm never, I never break it down in a sense that I'm going to read only one chapter or three chapters. If we have a daily plan, the plan that we have in church, for example, three chapters a day, five chapters on Sunday, you read the entire Bible, and, and you read the entire Bible in one year. But if the books of, uh, say, this book, Philipp Philippians, only has three chapters, the point is there's no point of reading only three chapters because you're going to miss the entire story, what it's, uh, what it's about. These books are very short. So the idea is you watch the entire movie. You watch, you read the entire book to have a deeper understanding of what Paul is trying to say. For example, in this, same thing with 2 Timothy, James, 1 Peter, any of these things you can read in less than 30 minutes. So the question stands for there's about 25 or 30 books that are left, which are the super long books. If you want to read the whole entire book, it could take you four hours, but we don't have four hours a lot of times to read it. So the easiest way, and I started to do the same thing. Before, I would say, I'm just going to read three chapters. I'm going to read five chapters. But then psychologically, it works differently when you set time. I'm going to read the Bible for 30 minutes. I'm going to read the Bible for 25 minutes, for uh, tw 20 minutes. And once you start reading, you're not looking at the chapters. You're just reading the story and seeing what it's going to speak to you versus just to put a check mark what I want to read. So when we watch the whole movie, number two is we, lo we learn from the shampoo bottle. True story or not true story, but there's a story that there was a man, and I'll tell you what, I, what I'm talking about. There was a man who had a business who was selling shampoo and, any, and lo those type of items. He said, I want to make more profit. Whoever helps me make more profit, I'm going to give you a, a, a cut of it. So he says for the shampoo bottle, bef before on the shampoo bottle, he used to say lather and rinse. And he said, just add the word repeat. And the guy was like, dude, it's a brilliant idea. They're going to put shampoo on their head two times, three times. The more shampoo they use, the more money we make. So now I check the shampoo bottle at home. It has those words on there. And you think it's common sense. You put shampoo, you rinse it, and then you're going to repeat it. That's when we were growing up. My mom said, wash your hair twice. You repeat it. So the same, the same idea is with, with Scripture. You don't read it once. Same thing with my son, Mark. I was going to Mark, read it. What is the story about? I forget. I was just, let's read it again. You repeat it till you're able to re say it in your own words. It's one thing to read it but not understand it. But when we, when we constantly repeat it in our mind, what's repeated, it stays inside of us. We're not trying to please someone. We're trying to grow. We're trying to know who Jesus is. We're trying to mature as Christians. So this is the practical stuff. When you go home, don't just say, I don't know where to read. I'm just going to open randomly. Pick something. Stick to the plan and read the word of God. And number three is to read out loud a lot of times. Why? Because when you look at it, there was a study done. Person who was presented material verbally, visually, or verbally and visually. A person, after 72 hours, participants retained 10% of everything that was said. 10%. People who heard, or who saw, sorry. So people who heard, 10%. People who saw, 20%. People who saw and heard 65% of information they're able to retain. So when we read the word of God, you can read it in your mind, just quickly scan the page. Or when we read out loud, we pronounce the words. You see everything that's going on. There is power in all that. And my challenge is for us is to pick a reading plan, a Bible reading plan. Pick something and just stick to it for a season. You know, you can read the Bible in four months. You're going to ask me, that's a good point. How can I read the Bible in four months? There's 1,189 chapters in the Bible. If you divide all, all of that, it's, you need to read 9.5 chapters a day. Right? That's going to take you about 35 minutes. Think about it. 35 minutes of reading the Word of God. And in four months, you read the entire Bible. Statistically speaking, you look at Gen Z, you look at any of the material, Five to six hours are spent on screen time alone. So you have five to six hours that we do on screen time. Here in 35 minutes, you can read the entire Bible, 9.5 chapters. That's one way. You can say, okay, that's too hard. Fine, do a different way. One chapter a day. When Jeremiah was starting to read, when he was in, thing, in second grade, he was starting to read. I said, Jeremiah, let's do one, one chapter a day. He would read a paragraph, I read a paragraph, he reads a paragraph, then he just started to read the whole entire chapter. So he did one chapter a day, and with one chapter a day, it took him one year, 
but he was able to complete the new, t- the new Testament. And that's the thing. If you read one chapter a day, you can complete the New Testament under nine months. It took us about a year. From one, his, on his birthday, he got a Bible and it took us about a year to complete the entire new, new Testament. This is at age, at his reading level. And to, to, uh, to, to our embarrassment, a lot of times when people take water baptism and the question you ask, have you read the New Testament? The question is no. And my question is, what have you been doing all your life? Even if you read just one chapter a day, by age 15, 16, you should have finished reading it. It is food for our soul. There's no way we're going to be victorious in life if we don't open the scripture. So I just want to leave this scripture with us. Psalm 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. But, in his, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And he's like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaves does not wither, and they prosper in all that they do. That is my desire for us to be not just a Christian who has that name or that title, but to be a believer, to be a firm believer. It doesn't matter what trials, temptations come my way, but I'm able to stand firm. Why? Because My foundation is Jesus Christ, who is our cornerstone. My foundation is the word of God, and I'm not going to shake. My doctrine is not going to shake because I know in the one that I believe I have studied. I have put, I was diligent in my studying. I put effort. I put time. I took my 35 minutes. I took my 30 minutes, but I did something. But if we don't do anything and the problems come, that's when we run into problems. That's why it's best to prepare before the problems arise. But even not even looking at that, for us just to have this desire to read Scripture. Let us stand up, and we're going to finish with prayer. It's a message that a lot of times is not a motivational, inspirational type of message where we feel goosebumps. But I think as a believer, there's time for everything. And there's a time for us to have this understanding that Scripture is also significant. There's also importance of reading Scripture for my daily life, for my spiritual man inside. The way we eat, the way we're going to go to lunch after the service, the same kind of food we have to give our inner man for us to grow as a, as a, as a believer, for us to mature as a Christian, for us not to be the same last year. One year passed and nothing changed. My mind is the same. My mind is not renewed. Nothing has changed. Why? Because I haven't done anything for myself. I just went by the motions. And my challenge for you guys this this afternoon is to take this as a challenge. Hey, I'm going to get into the Word of God. I'm going to give it a chance. I'm going to try to read at least one book, four chapters. That's 10 minutes of my time. I'm going to read at least one book. I'm just going to stick to it. I'm just going to read it multiple times for me to remember what Paul was trying to say to these churches, what the Gospels are trying to tell me. With our eyes closed, I want us to talk to Jesus and say, Jesus, you know who I, you know me. I don't have to lie. I can tell my friends that I read the Bible every day. But deep down, I don't even open this Bible. I lost my Bible, maybe. I want Jesus to help us in this moment. He's going to tell us what to do. He's going to tell us where we need to read, how long we need to read. He's going to guide us. He's going to lead us. But let us trust him as we talk to Jesus, as we worship Maybe it's your first time here. Maybe it's your second time. And you stepped away. We're not even talking about the Bible, but you stepped away from the Lord. You stepped away from faith. And you want someone just to pray with you. Maybe you had a rough week. It was a difficult week. Maybe you slipped and fell. Maybe you fell into sin. I want to say the altar is also open for you. This is a time of ministry, a time where we get together, a time that we can connect to heaven. Let us pray and let us speak.